Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, I mean over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here. <coughs> Deep in the point lonesome swamp in the oasis of freedom. It is a Sunday evening. It is a gorgeous Sunday twilight. Sunday, February 20th, so the little dog and I, we have been busy tearing down this shed from hell to start thinking about our new tiny house up at Bugs in a Jar Farm, and I'm finally getting to recover from that, and I remembered it is Sunday, so it is time for a doomsday sermon, and I want to <coughs> thank Alert, uh, Alert listener, well, I just had uh, Mark Hogarth. Brother Mark, I do appreciate you sending me this article from Dark Green Auckland, meaning New Zealand, fellow by a name I've never heard of, Andy Kenworthy. Andy Kenworthy giving us the bad news for any uh, little uh, apocalyptimist thinking that they are going to save themselves, their kids, and most importantly, the planet, by this, uh, you know, a perfectly great-sounding idea, permaculture, which is just kind of the new greeny term for organic gardening. Uh, I, I have been saying for years you know, I have been an organic gardener for half my life. I have taught organic gardening at the uh, at the junior college in uh, in Eugene, Oregon. I've had a big organic garden for years, and I have been saying for years uh, I'm a big proponent of organic gardening. But anybody who thinks that permaculture is going to feed a planet of 8 billion people. Got some bad news for you. We got some dark green news from New Zealand. Take it away. Andy Kenworthy and explain to anyone who does not understand this why permaculture won't save the world. <clears throat> Take it away. I hold a permaculture design certificate. I did a couple of months' works on projects in Vietnam with one of my tutors, Jeff Lawton. He's one of the top names in the discipline. You've probably heard of Jeff. Uh, but I don't believe permaculture and regenerative agriculture are solutions to our predicament. Uh, regenerative agriculture is another Cousin, they, that's the Alan Savory idea of how to save the planet. I'm not knocking Alan Savory, but uh, if anybody thinks that regenerative agriculture is a solution to our predicament, got some bad news for you. Take it away, Andy. The truth is, the truth is, they are more like what people, meaning, permaculture and regenerative agriculture are more like what people will be forced to do when all else fails. For most, it represents the, life the lifestyle we are all working so hard to avoid. There is an important reason I am pointing this out. A lot of what some environmentalists consider denial or ignorance is really people knowing their options only too well. They have decided they rather like their affluent, industrialized lifestyles. They are not going back to the land until they are forced to by poverty or the point of a gun as has already been test run by autocrats throughout history. <clears throat> Permaculture <coughs> and regenerative agriculture's core insight is pretty simple. <clears throat> we can grow a lot of organic food if we all, if we all become 
non-mechanized semi-subsistence farmers, but we knew that already. That's what most of us were doing for the last 10,000 years until the last 250 years, and most of us had a terrible time. We built colonies, industrialized civilization, and modern dentistry to get away from all that. Permaculture enthusiasts argue that the systems thought up by a couple of Australian academics in the 1970s somehow magically revealed some ways of farming vastly more efficient than anything handed down through hundreds of generations of lifelong farmers whose lives depended on it. The same goes for the sudden enthusiasm for regenerative agriculture is good, and regenerative agriculture is good. You know, uh, Rhett Butler at mongabay.com is a big proponent of regenerative agriculture, the Alan Savory model of saving the planet. And, and Alan Savory is a great guy. He just ain't going to save the planet. Okay? Uh, wake up, people. <clears throat> this strikes me as wishful thinking at best. It's more likely just startlingly arrogant. It even smells a bit like cultural colonialism. I'm, I'm sorry, cultural colonization. Yet again, things are discovered by white men from the dominant culture as if they never existed before. Farming without pesticides and machines does not take us all the way to a stunning new future of abundance for 8 billion people. It is much more likely to take us back to the 18th century when we were only poorly feeding an eighth of that population. And this is exactly what I have been saying uh, ever since I started on YouTube in 2008. That organic, agri organic farming, permaculture, regenerative agriculture, all of this stuff, it's great for a population of one billion people. It is how we fed a planet of one billion people or less for 10,000 years. Okay, up to one billion people, bring it on. It ain't gonna feed more than a billion people. And I can only wait to hear all of these little dreamers uh, calling me out on this with all your little studies. No, no, Sam. I have right here. I've got a study. I've got a study that says if we're not doing this, we can grow more bushels of corn on an anger. Shut up. Anyway, sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. Where were we, Andy? Some people who get into permaculture find they like a bit of hobby farming or a veggie patch, but that is usually as far as it goes. Well, my veggie patch last summer, I ended up throwing half of my gorgeous organic uh, garden fresh produce in the garbage, throwing it into the creek to feed the damn beavers is where half of my, I could not give away, could not give away my uh, organic homegrown produce in New York last summer, which is why I'm not gonna grow it this summer. I'm gonna grow enough for me to make some BLTs and some cream corn and grow flowers because you can't give it away, in, at least in Ithaca, New York. Anyway, in Vietnam, I worked on permaculture projects where rural people reverted to doing things in much the same way as their grandparents did. But now they had snazzy new names and diagrams. Back home, 
urban regenerative farmers are growing food in cities where there wasn't much before for really good reasons. Tower blocks make crap farms. This is this vertical farming, uh, this hopium about vertical farming where you can grow a few heads of lettuce for about $500 uh, heads of lettuce. Tower blocks make crap farms. Hydroponics needs power we cannot spare for lettuce and microgreens. And the idea of, a, of pointing elaborate lights at plants rather than just letting the sun get on with it is bonkers. In industrialized countries, most permaculture practitioners are cotton wooled inside the affluence of their technological societies. Most of the top permacultural, permaculturalists keep going by running courses, speaking at conferences, and convincing acolytes like me to work for free. It is remarkably like some kind of hippie pyramid sales scheme in the mud. <laughs> oh boy, I, I can see all the trouble this is going to get me into. Permaculture is remarkably like some kind of hippie pyramid scheme, pyramid sales scheme in the mud. <laughs> I think we found the title for this rant. <clears throat> I have permaculture friends who have been living in everything from buses in South America to woods in South Wales. All of them enjoy international flights, hospital visits, and inherited money. I just got an email today from someone I, uh, I kicked off of Collapse Chronicles talking about uh, how I am living off of my dead mother and my rich sister to finance my lavish lifestyle. It is my dead mother. Yes, uh, yes, and inherited money. All of that would be impossible if everyone lived completely in the style that permaculture suggests. None of them actually produce enough food for their household, let alone beyond it. And I actually did uh, produce enough uh, food for my household, but I could not even, outside of the corn, I could not get the two people living in my house to eat the, the, the garden fresh organic produce growing outside our cabin in New York. My own two friends. We, they did enjoy what we call the creamed crack, but as far other than that, I don't think they ever ate anything out of that garden all summer. Anyway, others of them suffer from, from what I call per, premature lifeboat syndrome. Let's take a real example. A couple I know spent two decades on 10 acres of land in an eco-village in rural New Zealand. They built up their small holding as a haven of simplicity and sustainability. When I met them in their 50s, they were knackered. They physically could not carry on. The volunteers they hosted would never do all the work. They had nobody to pass their property on to as their kids were not interested. Disheartened, they sold and went to live in the burbs where a lot of these people end up. It's like they jumped into a lifeboat on the Titanic with all the privations of those small rowboats only to pull the cover up once in a while and find the big ship still skimming the waves with the restaurant open. It would be hard 
not to feel cheated. This illustrates the calculation that almost everyone in the industrialized Western world is making. Basically, we are all wondering whether we can get away with our excesses for our lifetimes and maybe for our kids' lifetimes or when the hammer is going to fall and we have to go dig turnips in the rain. You know, I have always been saying I, I, am, I am just clinging to the fantasy that I am going to get my organic farming guilty ass out of here as the screen door is just hitting me on my guilty ass. Uh, hallelujah. That This guy, is, you understand, he is talking to people like me. This uh, I, I am exactly the person that this dude has in mind. Okay. Get it wrong one way, and we live in self-imposed poverty while everyone else scoffs the remaining luxuries. Get it wrong the other way, and our, sh and our shit might hit the fan, and we won't be ready. Most of us want the goodies today, and are prepared to go on risking it, and we have a load of immediate hassles to deal with that keep us distracted, like tearing down these buildings out here. So, it should not be surprising to the environmental movement that although people know where the lifeboats are, they are not rushing to climb into them. With things like careers and property prices, they know there is little hope of hopping back out again successfully if they go too early. Crucially, people are not being evil or, or stupid. They're just being practical and pragmatic. They're trying to enjoy their lives as best they can. They are trying to enjoy their lives as best they can, given that they are extremely unlikely to change the entire world around them. And I should just stop right there. Get out there and enjoy it while you still can. There's nothing you're going to do to change the trajectory we're on. There is one thing to do. Get out there and enjoy it while you still can. This is why the 50% of my message in the Doomosphere completely misunderstood by people. Uh, anyway, I should wrap up there, but anyway, I like this guy. A lot of people in the environmental movement seem either ignorant or suspicious of this. This is despite the fact that practical, pragmatic people are exactly the sort of people we are going to need if we stand any chance of avoiding a complete meltdown of human society. Deep down, most ordinary folks don't think of returning to the land as the good life. They think of it as the shit life of failure. I worked as a forester and gardener throughout my teens and into my late 20s. I know exactly how unromantic that can be late in the afternoon in the gray midwinter. I happen to like it, but not all the time. I did not think about supporting a family or my old age, and I still had the choice to do something else. The fact is, for most people in most places, Gardening sucks. Enforced gardening sucks worse, especially if you compare it to, say, surfing, getting wasted, 
or holidaying in exotic places. I gave it up when I realized I was unlikely to encounter a buxom maiden wandering in the woodlands in search of a male smelling like a goat with a collection of axes. Even the most liberated girls I know take this kind of lifestyle as far as a festival or two and no further. <laughs> I really, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting uh, to, to like this dude. Uh, one of my closest friends was among the most successful festival pool artists I have ever seen with a new girl perpetually on one arm and a didgeridoo in the other. He has since struggled for years to settle into a long-lasting relationship, largely because he lives a rugged existence in a forest. For most, permaculture is just like the aid work I have previously written about. It is a lovely, self-righteous place to visit, but you would not want to live there. And that is before we even consider the kind of primitive politics, if not outright anarchy, that is likely to predominate if we all go back to the land it, as modern day serfs. History may not repeat, but it does rhyme. This is something this movement studiously avoids talking about. It tends to assume manual labor somehow inevitably creates social harmony. I have tried to set up home in at least half a dozen permaculture-based eco-communities in New Zealand and the UK. One of the main reasons I never did was because their inhabitants generally displayed all the harmony and practical usefulness of an octopus playing bagpipes in a tank full of custard. I am not saying that the permaculture and regenerative agriculture are a waste of time. I'm not saying that people should not do, do it if they want to, or that they shouldn't apply its thinking along with other concepts to specific problems. It is just healthy to acknowledge when we're in a minority and that we are not going to solve all the world's problems with companion planning. So, what you may well be thinking, so you may well be, so what you may well be thinking, should we do, am I saying we should just give up? The truth is, I think we are going to end up with some sort of slowly collapsing fusion of social, economic, and spiritual operating systems. Some of our ideas will be good, some bad, some indifferent, and some downright evil. That is what has happened throughout history. It is called life. My key point is that once we stop grasping for illusory solutions, we will get better at getting on with reality with all its complexities and mess. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen, Brother Andy Kenworthy. <laughs> I can imagine uh, how much trouble Andy Kenworthy is in right now with all the buxom, uh, the, the, all the buxom young women. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 any, any doomer, particularly male doomer, uh, wondering if it's, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, you, you know, uh, permaculture, 
uh, going back to the land, whatever. Like, you, you know, I'm living out here in a tiny house in the Point Lonesome Swamp called Point Lonesome for good reason. Uh, if, if you have any uh, appreciation of buxom or flat-chested uh, young women or old women, uh, and, and you're thinking uh, of walking away from your comfortable lifestyle and your and your career and your nice home and your car, uh, you can give it up, buddy. She don't want to hear it. She does not want to join you in, in your little yurt out there in the mud. Uh, thank you, Andy, for pointing that out. And anyway, I'm going to take my little, uh, my little soulmate, who does enjoy living in a tiny house in the Point Lonesome Swamp. Get a dog if you're going down this road. <laughs> Make no mistake about this. Anyway, I've got to go have a margarita and recover from my hard day of manual labor at age 62, losing my mind, building another tiny house at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Get out there and enjoy it while you still can. And thank you. God for global industrial civilization because when it goes, it's going to suck. Bye, guys. Any of you who don't realize what my life looks like? <laughs>